and Hartmut Rosa. Um, the topic we are dealing with um, in this session is, well, um, some of cultural patterns and social imaginations because growth um, obviously is not only a matter of social or physical, of course, materialities, but also of thinking, of imagination. And the question is, how does growth enter in our collective and individual imagination? And I think the even more important question is, how can we get it out of our um, social, collective and individual imagination? And possibly it is important to answer the first question, how it enters, um, to answer as well the second question, how we can get rid of it. So we have two speakers this evening. Laura Abatica-Lupo is a professor in political philosophy at the University of Salerno in Italy and has come here, made her way for only one day to, to Leipzig in Germany. So thank you very much for, for this. directors of the, how did we call it a moment ago? <laughs> the, the research group on post-growth societies at the University of Jena. So Hartmut um, will be talking about str um, striving for growth, yearning for degrowth, uh, resonance as a solution to the good life problem. So if the first one is hard stuff, this is strange stuff, I guess. <laughs> Okay, the plan for this session is um, both will be talking for more or less 20 minutes. We will have both presentations um, uh, first going first. Then I will pose one question or two to each of, of them. And then immediately we will open the discussion to the, to the public. So um, we have so many people here, so I will try to organize this session um, as dialogically as possible between the two speakers and as interactively as possible between all of us and, and you. Okay, so we should start then. 20 minutes um, for Laura and yeah, please come to the floor and um, the floor is yours. I think there is a need for glasses. Allora, um, uh, I apologize for my uh, bad English and, uh, no? um, and uh, my bad pronunciation. So. <laughs> Do you do you uh, use no? No, you can use the other mic. Yeah, you, you can use this one, but we should. Yeah. 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 Hello, thank you. Allora, sorry for for my English and for my pronunciation. Allora, the neoliberal rationality, with, as Laval and Dordo say, has become for over 30 years the reason of the world, shared by the entire pla planet m with no significant conceptual and cultural antagonist. One moment. <laughs> what is? It seems that they don't hear us. Can we put this um, <laughs> sound louder? Or can you try, can try to speak more or into directly into it? Di nuovo? Ah, vabbè. Ah, non si sentiva. Di nuovo. Yes. I, apolo I apologize for my bad English. <laughs> well, the new... <laughs> the, allora, ok? Well. 
and the, no, no more apologizing. <laughs> the, neo allora, the neoliberal rationality with which, as Laval and Dardot say, has become for over 30 years the reason of the world, uh, shared by the entire planet with no significant conceptual and cultural antagonist, is a form of government that acts through new and diverse power devices. Its global spread and even its naturalization that eludes any a discussion, however, must lead us to consider in that the characters that have enabled this uh, planetary triumph. We must analyze its ambiguous nature and its ability to generate not merely passive subjects, but subjectifications ambiguously involved in the, in the active process of government and self-government. Only after analyze, analyzing uh, ambivalence and fascination of neoliberalism and if see its affinity to mul multiple and bottom-up social powers, its affinity to libertarian self-government, as Deleuze noted in Antiedipus, we can try to deconstruct its naturalness. That is, we can disarticulate the imagery that sustains it and we can understand where and how it operates selection and subjugation. Only then can we think of innovative perspective that will move from the real subjectivities that the neoliberal reason has already formed, taking advantage of their ambivalence. Foucault's uh, warning is, the resistance is against, but also always inside the power relationship. In summary, in this report, first I'll outline the concept of governmentality as a specific characteristic of the current neoliberal link through power. Today, governing means soliciting lives, not by a repressive, but by a productive function of power. Production is the key concept. It is understood as improvement, increase and growth of life, and it is achieved by opening the gap between what is and what is aimed for. In the space between, the governmental power finds its place. The next step analyzes the governmentality in the current phase of capi capitalism, the bi-economic productive way of governing that does not produce so much objects, but subjects. Thus, in the bi-economy time, in the exercise of power is reversed from heteronomy to self-government, and the political scene shifts inside the subject. Thus, the dynamics of the imagery of, um, the, uh, of the subject become crucial imagery of self-realization, of self-government, that is similar to the libertarian myth of the widespread refusal after the crisis of all kinds of socialism and communism of every form of delegation by individuals. Individuals are desiring machines in which the new global reasons prevail. But the imagery, and this is the last step, <laughs> plays a double phantasmatic role. On the one hand, it supports the adaptation to reality. On the other, it is the track of the real, concrete, as well as painful suffering of a subject, which don't correspond to it. And the long current crisis exacerbates this mismatch, while the form of governmentality not only does not change, but indeed stiffens. The empowerment and growth of this seemingly libertarian subject is under control. Now, through the tool of evaluation and self-evaluation that produces hierarchies and marks inequalities. Evaluation which obviously refers to the production. This is the key of the new reason of the world. Our goal should be to think a production without increase. Let's start, with, let's start with governmentality as a productive power. Foucault offers us a conceptual tool, governmentality, to grasp a technique of power other than the sovereignty that was typical of modern legal and political power. The logic of governmental power 
even that when it works in a political field, is economic, strategic and pragmatic, and it is measured by the successful implementation of a project, not by justice or legitimacy. legitimacy. It implies an important displacement from sovereign authority to technocratic authorities expert in the optimization of the living that is supposed to be the norm immanent to the population's life. Population, not people. Population, an economic, biological, or statistical term, not a political one. Or population or groups that differentiate exactly according to their, uh, their own potential productivity or risk. About this governmental technique, I would like to emphasize the most important character for our argument, productivity, not only as a goal of the ruled lives, but as the very mark of this power. That is, the ability of governmental power to be positive, to produce, to stimulate, to include rather than to suppress and to exclude. This productive nature shows its constitutive relations with capitalism, whose propulsive concept is exactly the idea of production as increase, therefore incessant growth, just as the prefix pro expresses. Why? We know that the conceptual background of modern capitalism is the postulate of scarcity, the, of goods, scarcity of goods, compared to the needs of a life that consists in the satisfaction of needs and desires. The supposed scarcity, the negative matrix that threatens lives, provide an unavoidable, incessant drive to increase a wealth that is never sufficient. The concept of scarcity is a logical device that just as the war of all against all in the Obeisian state of nature justifies the unitary order of the state, justifies the increasing effort to bridge the gap between goods and the needs, and now become limitless desires. And it is in this gap that plus production, plus gain, and the plus value of capitalism find their place. This plus, the increase of productivity is measured by its value by comparative evaluation. This gigantic self-referring me mechanism of product productivity to the bitter end cannot be understood by referring to need satisfaction, but it is a self-perpetuating crematistic mechanism. It is obsessed both by the plus profit and the al that allows the cycle of investment and the spiral of growth, and the plus desire that induces the spiral of consum consumption. The current neoliberal governmentality, governmentality has changed the aims of management, shifting it from the production of things to the production of subjectification, forms of life that will commit themselves freely, individually, autonomously, to produce to, to the most, to be creative, and to improve themselves in order to give ever more. The neoliberal governmentality is different from that of Fordist capitalist, despite the fact that both value productivity and economization of a human relation because it reverses the very point where power is applied. How is it possible that people want to govern themselves just like the system wants? Liberal conversion, weakening of the welfare state and of solidaristic values, demise of the public for the benefit of private enterprise, free market and financial power, all of this could not have been achieved if there had not been a widely shared col collect collective imagery. I use the term imagery to avoid the aporias of the term ideology. And I mean a cultural change, changing values and priorities, and an ideology that as such presents itself as natural and anti-ideological. 
neoliberalism is a form of life that extends the economic, economic logic of optimization to all the choice of the life of individuals, producing subjectification suitable for competition. The economy is the means, the goal, are the soul, is how Margaret Thatcher summed up the meaning of the new governmentality. Governing mentalities, governing people through intrapsychic devices, revolutionizing the social organization from within. Bioeconomic, exactly. A gigantic device that moving from the knowledge acknowledgement of the freedom of the living stimulates the, its empowerment, its active abilities, empowering freedom as a productive power. With a slim, but uh, at noted by Paul Machery, decisive shift of the capitalism keyword production from things to individuals, productivity that opens the living to the improvement, the increase inside their lives. The market becomes the criterion for evaluating the competition between individuals. And the finance becomes the abstract place of this infinite empowerment of uh, competitors. It's impossible to think this change in exclusively economistic terms. A great cultural revolution has reconstructed and has reconstructed a new social life by mixing the traditional values of liberal humanism, above all autonomy, with a new legitimacy, totally immanent to the social, against any transcendent representation or delegation. It gives voice to the widespread instance of libertarian self-government, of freedom from the bureaucratic classification and limitation. This accounts for the spread of the new governmentality compared to the decline of the left's tradition of solidarity and management. The life cannot bear to give up differences in favor of what is common. It pushes to achieve saturated the desires in a competitive exercise of the power that each as an inter entrepreneur of himself capitalizes. Please note that everyone self obliged to self-government. Freedom must govern itself, must follow the rule immanent and therefore natural of the optimization that both a trivialized Darwinian biological matrix and the trite social psychology provide self-help and adaptation to environment conjunctures, flexibility as a princip principle extended to every fields of emotional and working life. Here is the root of consensus, a shared imagery of self-implementation and personal responsibility that frees the creative energies of, every, of everyone. These concepts are well known, uh, uh, but I would again call your attention to a type of government that urges on, forces self-government, but which is nevertheless a technique of control. In what way? The control is not exercised by discipline and role subject, but ex, but ex ante by fostering the collective imagery that every soul is perceived as autonomous and exposed by evaluation and self-evaluation of the results of the or, of its own productivity, as mes measured by market evaluation. And as we know, and Lacan says, the idealized imagery of the fast is the phantasmatic mirror that supports the being part of the system. It structures behaviors, choices, even beyond but not regardless, the symbolic social identification. This imagery has a huge Function, function in shaping the desire. It is not the mere hallucinatory fulfillment of a wish, but it is the fantasy that teaches us how to desire. And today it teaches us to desire not only the success of our empowerment, but also the self-assessment of our ability to implement it we become controllers of ourselves. Thus, 
uh, that it is at the level of the social imagery that we have to de deconstruct the complex device of a bioeconomy. In the post for this time, its imagery has the brightness of freedom, debureaucratization, refusal of a vertical planning, cooptation in the governance of social forces, the myth of the little garage where creative genius in sneakers changed the world, lightness and flexibility in the organization, having fun while you work and work while you have fun. Deep and pounding is the change of the common sense. The persuasive power of the imagery is very high. It relies on differences and inequality as values, on the intolerance for heteronomy, in, on the involvement of individuals in the game of unequal potential enrichment, relies on the drive to the endless enjoyment, to the strip. But there is a dark side, an unsaid reverse of the image, image of urgency and creativity. Victorious competitions, in, it in fact obscures, removes or forecloses an existing real gap, the suffering and the uneasy feeling of the gap between reality and, is, and its idealized image, a gap that splits the subjectivity. The splits are removed ghosts of pain, with reappears in time of crisis. Self-governing, self-managing our talent, evaluating ourselves, means recognizing the success of our enterprise, but also, and more often, of our failure. The victorious imagery crosses, therefore, the material hardness of the market which is the ultimate judge of lives. The waves of creativity freed by the antipunitive imagery are ruled to enter the validation of the competitive market. Negri, Antonio Negri, enhances the Dionysian productive power of the general intellect. Boltaski and Chiapello Emphasize the, the creative, creative artist future of a post fordist capitalism. capitalism. Then does the bioeconomy turn the inputs of the libertarian protest of the 60s, reorganizing them in capitalist form? Surely creati creativity is push pushed into the stream of capitalist exploitation. More and more, and therein, sooner or later, we'll be, we will be loser. We will fail the competition. Then the removed ghost reappears. We feel our defeat, not working, not producing enough, bound by the debt of the pig's country. <laughs> Italian pig's country. In German, should, in German, should, means debt, but also guilt. We feel our failure and an inadequacy. And what is worse, we are responsible for our frustration, our for our marginalization in the low steps of the social hierarchy, for our defeat that is more severe because it's due to ourselves only if we think all over again the key concept of our cult culture, production has increased. The very concept, concept that opens the gap of plus productivity, productivity in which power places itself, we will not be afraid of the ghost, but as Lacan says, we will be able to traverse it. Thank you. Much good. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Laura. But you're not leaving yet? No. no. Um, okay, please. Please. Um, I, I decided spontaneously to change a little bit plans. I, I would like to ask one question immediately to Laura, um, because I know of the governmentality of Hartmut Rosa and how he is able to 
non-repressively teach us what we desire, and I am afraid that you will then get too many questions out of the public. So um, one one question, I think the very important point you made was about the attractiveness of neoliberalism, depicting us as free and autonomous and uh, self-guiding and flexible subjects. Um, but uh, what my question would be, what is the alternative to the neoliberal governing of the subject? Is it a solidaristic governing of the subject, another way of governing the subject, or another way of self-governing our, our subjectivity, or non-governance, or, or what would be the alternative to a neoliberal form of governing um, the self? Difficult for me uh, to uh, to reply. Um, I think that um, uh, is not uh, easy the, uh, to to um, to go out of uh, a, a, a culture that condition our subjectivity. I think that um, it's possible to um, uh, rethink the concept of desire. Um, that uh, Deleuze um, charged with um, with the production mm -hmm. as um, uh, as becoming as uh, um, if production uh, uh, remain the the key um, key concept of uh, of our life. Uh, it, this is. Um, Impossible to, uh, to 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 go out of yeah. neoliberalism, mm -hmm. but if we if we, if we uh, rethink it and uh, we um, so no no solidaristic simply uh, common uh, is not simple simply. Solidaristic uh, way is a, is a, the common is a, the the participation the mm -hmm. no, of of all uh, but uh, without um, um, without delegation with a, a form of 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 organization of uh, of common not uh, not non fondata sul sacrificio, come si dice? Not based on the sacrifice, mm -hmm. on the, ecco, not based on the sacrifice, but, but also um, we have to, to know that it is impossible to, um, to live our culture. Our uh, young people is, um, is um, formed in this, um, in this, um, Autonomy in this uh, safe uh, improvement. Uh, this is impossible to change. This is uh, and, and now the new forms of political uh, movement are uh, uh, are not for solidarity, but for um, uh, interest uh, on the on the on a local uh, problem on a local question and uh, and and the govern of this question only non c'è un italiano uno che sa l'italiano ah sì ecco allora eh, perché mi eh, che diavolo dai e eh, datti una sbossa do this later please um, um, th this this should not make your answer very much longer. <laughs> no, no, uh, you, you can follow, but, but only for one or two minutes. Eh, no, Quindi la nostra gioventù non... No, la nostra gioventù pare che è il fascista. No, young ones. Spiega, spiega di che è una forma di partecipazione, sono... Vabbè, 
come tu sai, tu hai partecipazione però senza, senza delega, non, non sul progetto di solidarietà, che è per casa di tutti. I knew it! Ok, so. I told you. Young generations are educated in a system in which uh, like the basic principle is not solidarity which implies sacrifice and like you know having a No. <laughs> exactly. I'm saying they are che non sono abituati a questo. They they are they are not educated in this kind of environment in which like you know solidarity, sacrifice and opening towards the other. But they are educated in an environment in which <laughs> self-improvement <laughs> okay. politically the consequence is a form of participation which is not Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They act as stakeholders. So local stuff in which their interest is direct mm -hmm. and there is not that kind of uh, like you know more uh, powerful or uh, more profound engagement which would be a solidarity based one. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I tried my best. And it's You are staying here with us. Uh, <laughs> we will be needing you again. So, um, okay. So, thank you for the moment, Laura and Lele. <laughs> and Hartmut Rosa is now coming for um, not more than 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you can also look at it. 20 and 20, 56. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. This was the hard stuff. Now we turn to the strange stuff, <laughs> as Stefan Lesnig said. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd like actually to, to, to thank you, to thank all of you for coming here. I really think, uh, I mean, for the, to the conference in, uh, in Leipzig, because this is, I mean, it, it shows something, right? I think it's, a, it's actually, it's a visible sign, and it's also, it's not just visible, you can also feel it that people still care about the future of the world and about the future of the... So yeah, I mean, this is not self-evident, right? We could, on the one hand, we could just give it up and think, okay, I mean, maybe we are lost anyway, or at least we don't know where we are going. So I think it's not just that you do care. It's also that I think coming here, at least to me, right, what you do is, is uh, giving a sign and showing and demonstrating that you still have at least some faith in the idea that we can change the course of the world, right? That it's not a machine running. I mean, you, you were talking, Laura was talking about the neoliberal machine, but I think, but what she said, of course, also spoke to us in a sense that it's not a machine that cannot be changed, right? By acting together, by coming together, by sharing and developing ideas, and by caring about the future of the planet, I think we do something in, in my new, what I try to do theoretically, I would say, Maybe what we do here is creating a sphere of resonance that does have some consequences, right? We might not yet see what the... Con yeah, okay, I know. I mean, I'm, for the longest part of my academic life, I was very skeptical too, and I thought, okay, we can talk and talk, and it doesn't have any impact. But now I would actually change. Maybe it does have an impact. I just recently read, actually the other day, <laughs> I mean yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> I read Paul Williams, he's a rock journalist, and he was describing the spirit of Woodstock, right? And I think it's, it's very interesting. It wasn't so much about argumentation. I mean, Woodstock was a musical thing, but maybe it's not an accident that music and politics in the 60s somehow came together because what they, they really thought they can feel the 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 uh, uh, the the motion they they could they could create a sphere of commonality and maybe a sphere of sound where where he said they were convinced that this had an impact on the future of the earth it wasn't just talking right just making arguments it was the idea of sharing a world and for ca caring about a world we share and i think something of this might come out of it uh, too but uh, i mean before we get there we have a problem <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and this problem, I think, was uh, uh, described very neatly uh, by Laura too. It's like we are in a machine which is geared towards growth. It's not just economic growth, right? What we can uh, uh, read from the gross domestic products. I mean, as I think the main point, at least how, how, how I understood it from Laura, was what that she said, it's in our heads. Somehow it's in our head and our soul, this logic of growth and increase. And the, and the question we are dealing with in this session is how does it get there, right? And how could we get it out of our minds? And I think to understand how it gets there, first we need to see what it does. And I think, I mean, you would not be here if you didn't say, yes, there's a problem. We don't like this incessant need for growth and acceleration and innovation, which is totally empty, right? It, doesn't, it's, it never has an end. The logic of capitalist growth, you know that, right? It's, it's that it's never enough. No matter, actually, the problem is the more we grow this year, the more we have a problem next year because we have to top it, right? <laughs> And it doesn't matter how fast you are this year, next year you have to be faster. So obviously this is idiotic, right? And all of us would say, <laughs> okay, we live in a perverse system. But I think on the other hand, it's really, it's really fascinating. And I don't mean this in any way offensive. But if you look at ourselves, of course it's true that we replicate, we reproduce, we have totally internalized this logic of increase and growth. I mean, we do things like coming to a conference like this by airplane, of course, for just one day. I mean, this is what all of us do. I have an, yeah, I know, we do, we do all of these things. And I have an iPhone and I know it's bad, but we all... <laughs> <laughs> it's not me, it's the system, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But I think I even if you look, if you even if you look at degrowth conferences, I find it really, I find uh, honestly, I find it fascinating, and I think we need to understand it. Uh, it 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 aspires, it 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 really aspires to grow. I mean, the, the organizers say we are more people than ever before, right? <laughs> we have more panels, we we create more media attention than we ever did before, and now we even have a live stream. Uh, that, that's perfect, right? But there you really see, uh, that's, and I'm honest when I say I don't mean it offensive, but you see, we totally replicate this logic, right? We create more attention, we create more people, we have more papers, more panels, and so on. And this is the, only, this is the way we think about ourselves and about the world, right? The logic of increase of acceleration of innovation. And in order to understand it, it's very important to see that uh, how, how it gets there, as I said. I mean, one answer is to say, well, it's human nature, right? Human beings always strive for increased growth, innovation. And I think that's just not true. That because, and then in the end, that's the neoliberal argument. They say, well, you, are, you just are that way. And that's uh, maybe too bad for us, but it's human nature. But, but then it would just be greed or so. It would be a wrong attitude. And we could easily change it. And therefore, the first step, I think, is very important to see. It's a systemic need, right? It's built into the structures of society. A capitalist society, in, 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 in particular, right, cannot exist without growth. It's not a question of whether we want to increase. We simply have to. I mean, in the, in the way we are organized at this moment. And this is not just true for the economy. I believe it's even true for universities and so on. When I look at what universities do, they try to prove we have more students, more third party funding, more publications and so on. But it's very easy to see with capitalism, right? Karl Marx, of course, would be an interesting uh, um, a theoretical starting point for this. The logic of increase is built into the system. It's, uh, it's money, commodity, money prime, right? Money is only set in motion in the form of capital if there is a promise for increase. And if the increase stops, you can see what happens then from Greece, for example, right? We lose jobs, companies close down, tax revenues decline, but the, but the, the expenditure of the welfare state increase because of unemployment and so on. So you get a, 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 a debt problem, and in the end you get even delegitimation of the current political system. So if we don't increase, if we don't grow, if we don't accelerate and innovate, we cannot stay as we are, but we slide back. Right, so one of my main points really is it's a systemic need for growth and if we don't satisfy it, we cannot stay who we are. So my main diagnosis would be we are not, it's not the greed, the, the, the need for increase which is driving us in the first place, but it's the fear of losing ground, of, of not being able to sustain the status quo. So that would be the, 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 first, the first argument, right? And that means, if that's true, I think it's very important conceptually I would say for all of us, a degrowth society, which we are aspiring to, that's why we call it post-growth in Jena actually, is not one that necessarily shrinks or that will never innovate or grow or accelerate. 
what because sometimes it's it's if you if you are if you're short on bread it would be a good idea to grow it in, in the bread production right or it's also good to innovate something against ebola or, or ebola or, or cancer or other diseases but we should overcome what we are looking for is a system that does not necessarily need to grow to increase to speed up to innovate in order to keep the status quo but this is important because our degrowth community right is always in danger that people say but look at people in africa they are starving from hunger so don't we want don't you want growth there so that's not a problem for a post growth society quite to the contrary right you can really show how through the current system systematic scarcity is produced in africa and elsewhere right of course we want growth and innovation but not uh, but we want to overcome a system that needs to grow innovate accelerate in a blind way now the inter the interesting question is how do, how is this system sustained through the subjects and now i want to move in three steps i have a uh, 12 minutes for this also uh, the first is uh, the, the first argument is uh, it's coercion right to a large extent we feel that we need to satisfy the logic of growth as i said i think we are driven by fear much more than by anxiety but then the second step which i find at current more interesting is that i think we also want because because of a certain conception of the good life this it might be totally unnoticed by you or not conscious but i think we are all driven by a logic of increase of a certain kind and i want to explore this and then i want to say how we can get out of it <laughs> okay first point how does it get into our minds? And uh, my first argument is by coercion, and that's very, very close to what Laura said, right? I think somehow we are always, what I say, subjects of guilt. It's, it's close to what you said already. We feel guilty if we don't improve in a certain sense, right? And, and I would actually claim that's true for all of you. The, the, to, if maybe tomorrow night you sit at home, you feel guilty. I claim, right? If you sit beside the fireplace or wherever you want, want to sit. I mean, why do you feel guilty? I mean, Benjamin Franklin would say, yeah, because you should remember that time is money. And probably you say, well, no, that's not my problem, right? I don't want permanently an increasing uh, 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 amount of money. But uh, I, I would add with, uh, with, uh, to Benjamin Franklin, yeah, but the problem is that in the neoliberal age, you also remember that time is social relations for example social capital right and then you think oh it's true there's this email by that friend or maybe by the degrowth conference organizers i should answer that and i always wanted to call up this friend or this uh, person i know or so on or oh, you remember oh yeah that's true my neighbors they are new and uh, maybe i should talk to them or so right so you remember that your time uh, it, it could be used for increasing social capital, you can say in, in a bad way, but actually, but, but so you probably don't think about it in capital ways because you're not capitalist. But of course, <laughs> but of course, you know, it's important to know people, to care for people, to have friends and so on. And so you try to increase your relationships. Maybe you say, no, I'm, I'm not concerned about money. I'm not concerned about social relationship. That's fine. Okay, so then you sit beside the fireplace and then, <laughs> and then, you remember, oh, maybe actually I should pick up with the news, right? I don't know what's going on in the world. I've lost track of the Ukraine, of Syria, of many other things. So you start reading through the news or you start reading Shakespeare because you've never done it. <laughs> <laughs> or you say, oh, yesterday he talked about Woodstock. I have this Woodstock movie. Maybe I should see that, right? So actually you remember that, that time is cultural capital, is knowledge, is increasing your stock of knowledge of, of, of capabilities and so on. But maybe you say, no, sorry, I don't care for money, I don't care for education, I don't care for friends. Okay, good for you. <laughs> then maybe <laughs> you sit beside the fireplace and remember, actually, I could do something for my body, right? Go a little. <laughs> okay, I see. <laughs> Well, that's the neoliberal governmentality, right? You, you never went for jogging and you know that movement, physical exercise is good for you. Okay, so you do something for this. Maybe you even don't care for physical exercise and for how you look. But then you remember that for the good life, it's very important to relax, to meditate. <laughs> so whatever you do, I mean, this is what I say. It, it, it creates subjects of guilt. It's very, very hard to get out of this, of this uh, inner urge, right? And, and, and you can also go uh, argue, argue this point through to-do lists. At the end of the day, you've never finished the to-do list. But now, okay, so I think you got that point, right? So <laughs> next point. 
But I think this is not enough to explain why we cannot get out of this machine of increase, of innovation, of acceleration. Be because no system can survive in the long run, and capitalism, for example, survives for more than 200 years now. And no system, I believe, could survive in the long run if it did not have some uh, promise, right? some attractivity. And I really think it's true if we look at ourselves. It's not just that we feel we have to. We also want to. Now, the interesting question is, what do we want to? And I think that really this is very deeply ingrained culturally, even on the, in the liberal ways of thinking. It comes through our conception of autonomy also, right? Uh, that a good life is one that increases our reach over the world, our hold on the world, right? I really believe that you think when you think of your decisions, I will come to the examples in the end. I want to first make the argument. So, so the argument is, no, no, I go through the examples straight away. <laughs> Otherwise, Stefan Lesnick will stop me, right? So, so why is money attractive? But I'm not sure how attractive it is to you, but I think I found out that for many people who say, I don't care about money at all, it's very interesting, right? When it really comes to money, they all of a sudden care a lot about it. But no matter, why is it not for you, but for other people, money attractive? <laughs> so, and I think, it's obvious why it is attractive, right? Be because when you have a lot of money, right, you can do many things. You bring the world within your reach. If you're really rich, you can afford to fly to Tokyo or San Francisco or Los Angeles or Melbourne tomorrow if you want to. So having a lot of money brings the world within your reach. You can also buy a spectacularly good telescope or you can buy, a, 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 I don't know what, musical instruments and other things or maybe even a ship. Right? You, you can do things. You bring the world within your reach. You, 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 you increase your scope and your hold over the world. So maybe you say, well, but still money is not attractive for me. No, no, it, it, I, can, I can now go through the same spheres as b before with the guilt side, right? Now we don't look at guilt, we look at attractivity, right? So why is knowledge interesting for you? Education. Well, you say, I want to learn English or some other language because it opens up a whole new world of knowledge, of literature, of music, of people you can connect to, right? So you want to learn languages, you want to explore new forms of knowledge because it opens up parts of the world. It brings them within your reach. If you, can, if you know English, you can read Shakespeare in the original and so on, right? And, uh, and uh, oh, I have to look at my... <laughs> uh, I had so good. I had such good, uh, such such good. Uh, yeah, ideas. Uh, why is okay? <laughs> Thanks. Oh yeah, I wanted to make this argument in Germany, like with our school system, right? If 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 a kid wants to be a gardener or a mechanic or a baker, what do you tell him or her? If it's your son or daughter, you tell her, oh, still get the high school diploma, the Abitur, right? Why? Oh, because it opens up a whole world of options for you, right? You never know what you want to do in the future, so it's a stock which enables you to do more things. And, and then there's something which probably is true to you too. Why do people all over the world want to live in cities rather than in the countryside? Right? Why? I think for most people it's true, uh, who are here, uh, it's, it's true too. Why is Leipzig more interesting than Jena, for example, right? <laughs> or than the Black Forest? Well, people, <laughs> people move there. <laughs> Because it opens up, it gives you possibilities. People in Berlin notoriously say they are so proud of the three opera houses. They can go there whenever they want to. They don't, they don't go there. <laughs> but, but, but they have the options, right? It increases the range of options. And, and why is a smartphone attractive? I mean, I know so many people who said, I will never get it. And then they, well, maybe they resisted for two or three years. I even know some who gave it up for a year or so, and then they have it again. And wh why is it interesting? Why is it attractive? You can say, I, I don't have it because it's attractive, but then I don't believe you, right? It somehow is attractive. It, it, it's, of course it's attractive because it brings the world into your pocket, right? Now, I really have the world in my pocket, the knowledge of the world, the literature of the world, the music of the world, the news of the world, and I have all the contacts in my pocket. So I think it's really true we follow this logic increasing our range of options, but that's how I described it for many years. Now I would say it's not just the range of options, it's really bringing the world within our reach. That's our conception of the good life, making world available, right? I I moving forward towards new horizons. And maybe th this is not just bad, right? But uh, in a sense, I would say it is bad. I mean, because it's driving the logic of growth, acceleration, innovation. Now, how do we get it out of our minds? I mean, that's quite difficult, right? If it's true that we follow this logic. And I think if we rethink, we, we start changing the world, if we rethink what really, 
what are the important points in your life, right? What are the important moments if in your life? What are the maybe the secret yearnings which you do not satisfy? I think people wouldn't come to degrowth conferences if this was the perfect way to, to lead our lives, right? So what's the problem with it? The problem I try to describe with the term of alienation, right? The problem is that you might get the whole world into your reach because you have money and smartphones and, and other things. But you, you are in danger. That's what people feel. They can actually feel it. The danger is that it doesn't speak to us anymore, right? It doesn't move us anymore. It becomes a dead and silent world which we command, right? But it doesn't touch us. I think there are so many instances where you can see all the protest forms against this logic of increase. They are almost, almost always inspired by what I call the idea of resonance, but I would rather say the, re the yearning for resonance. You want to be connected. To, you want to actually, uh, our relationship to the world is of a different kind. The good life the change, the, the, the capitalist way of life, the neoliberal way of life, and the good life, I think the difference is in the way of relating to people, to things, to art, to nature maybe, right? So what, what do we aspire to? And I think, uh, when you think, if I ask you, what was the really important uh, moment in your life, in, in your last year maybe, right? I think m almost all of you would come up with a story which ends with, and that really touched me. That really moved me, right? That had an, it's because it left something like an, a, a lasting impression on us. And, and this impression, it's not about a state of mind. Resonance is not a state of mind or emotion. Resonance is a form of relating. And, and you can see this, for example, in the ecological. A lot of people who are here are, uh, are uh, inspired by the ecology, by, by ecological concerns. Why, what is that about? Right? I think it's not about resources. I think the ecological movement is not successful as long as it thinks it's about preserving resources. Because that's exactly in the logic of increasing our, our reach over the world. Right? We need resources to sustain our form of life. But what people is really are driven by when they are ecologically concerned is the idea that, uh, that nature is a sphere which actually has something to tell us. Right? People go to the forests, they move to the mountains or to the oceans. Because there they feel connected. You can actually, the phenomenology is quite good in describing what happens to us. If you stand at the ocean, at the sea, you, you change even in, in the way you stand there. Your physical, uh, your habitus changes. You open up, you feel connected to the waves as they roll in, or to the forest, or to the mountains. And that's why we care about ice, bears, and other animals, right? Not because they are resources we, because, which we might need, but it's something we can connect to. And it's the same with. Yeah, I've seen it, yeah, two minutes. <laughs> it's the same with, uh, I can go through uh, all the spheres now in art, for example, right? Why do, you, why do you care for music, if you care for it, and I think you do, right, most do. Or for other forms of art, why do people go to museums? It's not about bringing the world in reach in the first place, but people want to be moved, touched. I can make all these arguments, even in the cinema, right? You like to cry there. You get, you get out of the cinema and, said, and say, it was such a great movie, I, I cried so much, right? <laughs> so how can it be great if you cry? So there you see, it's not about a state of emotions, it's about a state of relating. You relate to a story. Narrations are those things which create resonance in you. You hear a story, you see a story, you feel it, and it touches you and it resonates with you. And I think that's the problem with, uh, that's actually the problem with uh, democracy too, right? In, in, in democracy, uh, people aspire for resonance, creating a sphere of resonance. I just read the other day Nancy Love's book, Musical Democracy. I like it very much. There, her idea is that the problem with current democracy, why so many people are fed up with it, right? Because in th this works much more in German than in any other language. Uh, uh, th the idea is democracy is about making your voice heard. Right? Making a voice heard is already a resonance thing, right? And it's, of course, in acting together, in creating a sphere of acting together, creating a sphere of resonance. But the representative form of democracy we have right now is about die Stimme abgeben, right? <laughs> Sie geben die Stimme ab, right? You, you, you vote and then there's an aggregation of interests and preferences and negotiations and so on. This is nothing to do, this is a betrayal of the resonance quality of acting together, of appropriating the world, of getting the world speak to you, 
right? And I, I think in Gezi Park and in Tahir Square and in Tiananmen Square and in Maidan and in many other places, in Stuttgart and in many other cases, people wanted, they really shouted at the public world and at politicians, right, in an attempt to recreate forms of political resonance. So I think what we should do starting today in Leipzig is creating public spheres of resonance. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I knew this would happen. <laughs> I told you in advance. Um, yeah, he, he's able to s create such a sphere of resonance. Um, uh, it was such a good talk. It moved me so much. I, I was crying all the time. <laughs> Touchy. Um, yes. Okay. Um, W one point I, I want to make, I, I, I felt a little bit uh, uneasy with the Woodstock analogy. I liked it very much that this, it was not raining here today, so uh, um, hope it um, keeps not raining the next days. Uh, one, one question to, to Hartmut as well, and then I will open the discussion for uh, to all of you. Um, the central point of your uh, talk and of your concept is that um, Grow, the problem of growth and with growth is um, the need for growth only to keep the engines going and only to keep the system stable. But in the end, this is a very uh, quite abstract and fuzzy criterion. So, so what is then good growth and what, what is bad growth? which growth keeps the engine going and which not, which keeps the system stable and which not. And who decides about that, if it's not Hartmut Rosa? So, um, who, who decides about what is, what is growth we really need for and uh, which is growth we can, well... Yeah, I think. I mean, I mean, of course, that's not an easy. I mean, it's not not an easy to answer question. But I think you can actually see it conceptually. It's relatively easy because when uh, when people in the European Union, from Angela Merkel, actually from Merkel to Schröder and to all basically all of our politicians, they always talk about the need to keep the gr to, to 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 start the growth engines. Hollande, for example, right now, but many others too. And there you can actually see this is not about satisfying a certain need, right? If someone says we need growth period. It's obviously in the wrong track. If someone says, we need more telescopes, I would say, yes, go for it. I think so too. <laughs> On more Pink Floyd CDs. But, I th but, I th but for me, that's a huge difference. And it's actually, you see how the logic of blind increase enters our university minds, right? Pe our, you can really see it there. And I think that's where we need to start with us and what happens to us all the time now professors like Lesenich and myself think, oh, oh, we might run, this program might end, we need more third party funding. Let's think of some, somehow how to get it in, right? Or let's create some, some new way of, of attracting new uh, foreign students or so. So, so, uh, so. so the question is, if you have a research question first and then you say, oh, this is such an interesting question, I want to get, get it funded, that's okay. If you say, we need some research program to get more third party funding, what could we talk work about? Then it's wrong, right? So I, th I really think it's an easy in indicator. What is, the, what is the impetus? What is the starting point? Is it growth or acceleration of a certain so form? Or is it some real aspiration, inclination or need? So actually it's quite easy. Okay, it seems. Um, um, ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so um, it seems that Laura wants to to put a question. Uh, Lele for Laura, a question to Hartmut. Yeah, Lele, please. It's a <laughs> tragically difficult question to translate. So I'll do my best. Okay. Okay. So she started to pose the question uh, when you did the, like you know made the, the example of the telescopes. Yeah. And the idea is. Right if now. I yeah right yeah. now like you know if I corrected uh, yeah. understood that correctly the idea is uh, but it's not really a matter of needs because every need anthropologically speaking yeah. is charged with desire yes. and if desire is a uh, production yeah. like you know in a yeah, yeah. in a Deleuzean way so then yeah. mm, the problem for Deleuze was how to separate this productivity from capital yeah. 
Yeah. So there is. Like, you know, the problem uh, for yeah. the laws was exactly how to decouple yeah. the productivity of desire yes. <laughs> to separate, yeah. to cut. Yeah, I know, yeah. Desire and needs yeah. when desire uh, is yeah, production, yeah, okay. it's impossible to separate yeah, know, yeah, needs yeah. from the need. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think that's a, that is a very important question, right? If I think if if uh, Laura's argument is right, and I think it is right to to a large extent, right, that our needs are produced by the system too, then my argument somehow is not sufficient, right? Because then, of course, we have a need. As I said, uh, it, you're right with the telescopes. I, it's not true for telescopes, but for all the other things. <laughs> Uh, 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 that's a s that certainly is a problem. I, I mean, in the end, what I really think what we need is a democratic form of the, right, this sphere of resonance about deliberating about what we need or want and what we don't want or need. Uh, but but the democratic, it doesn't have to be centralized. It could be small forms of communities maybe who decide on it. But the, I have another, because this question, I mean, can we distinguish? And I, I think we can't real needs and false needs, right? That's very, very difficult. But I think what we can really see in our own aspirations, I can see it from mine. I'm not talking about stupid people out there, right? I, I, talking, I talk about what we do, what I do. And I think capitalism, what capitalism does, it, 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 transpo it transforms our, our yearning, our need for resonance into a desire for products, for objects. You can really see it by looking at, uh, you can either look at, at the advertisement or you can look at your own psyche, right? We think, I mean, the advertisement is very straightforward there. You buy this new thing, Deo or whatever it is, shampoo, and then you relate in a totally new way to your family, to, to nature and so on. So you see, they sell you a form of relationship. It's always a promise of relating to things. And, 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 and you think you get the relationship by buying the object and then you're always dissatisfied with the object and that keeps you buying the next object. I think that's exactly the trick of capitalism and we can, over, we can overcome this uh, in the long run, I hope. Follow-up question or, or no? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the point was exactly like, uh, what if contemporary capitalism sells experiences instead of objects? Like, you know, in yeah, the yeah, 40s. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it, but yet, but it, yeah, but it doesn't sell. Yeah, it promises experiences, but it doesn't satisfy them. But I think it, I think it doesn't satisfy them in the in the long run. It doesn't. I, I see it with CDs. I'm a junkie of CDs, right? And I realized finally, maybe I overcome it. The more I buy, the less I get out of them, right? And, and therefore, there's a betrayal in the system. <laughs> okay. So I, I wanted to foster dialogue, but not trialogue. So um, unless Leto wants to give a talk of, on his own now, uh, I would now open the discussion to the public. We have half an hour, more or less. Um, as you see, you might pose your question in English, German, Italian, Spanish, at least. So um, go ahead. I, I, I saw one, yeah, finger. You please.
uh, for a long time, but, but how do we get this ambivalence of this relativity out of the society? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm short. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a good uh, that's a good suggestion because I don't know what the right answer is. I mean, <laughs> I mean, obviously it's true, right? What we need is changing historically, right? And what you describe that we need more and more energy. That we think it's not just that we think we need more and more energy. You see it right here. I'm absolutely sure for this group of people, we need we we, we use up more energy this year than we did last year, right? But of course, this is within this system of growth and increase and that's why I say in the first place we shouldn't be so much uh, I believe concerned with with shrinking it would already be a huge step if you overcome this incessant need need for increasing what we need so what from what I suggest I think the first step would be to just stop this logic of increase and I think this would be possible at the current level of needs and if we actually do this if we jump out of the box of the neoliberal mentality right then we actually might be in a position to reassess and reevaluate our real needs and i i mean of course you know i mean if if the resonance idea is true and of course it is true <laughs> <laughs> Then we might soon, in, I mean, that a lot of people discover that the so-called simple forms of life in nature or whatever it might be, or new forms of commonalities, satisfies their desire for resonance much more than the new commodity. And that might in the end lead to a decrease of energy increase, uh, of energy use. I don't know. I mean, you find out in the other panels. <laughs> oh, we agree. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have at least 10 or 12 people who have already have shown their fingers and I'm afraid we, I will have to be unjust and discriminatory, um, so um, please don't, don't mind about that. Yeah, I will collect two or three um, and we will go um, on now by gender justice. Um, so the next one will be someone defining himself as man um, and this is you. Yeah. and to try to bring the otherness 
not by eliminating the distance. Okay. I, I yeah, the please. Distance, but in a different way. This is, I think, the, the, the big difference between uh, okay. the post so, so, Sorry, sorry. Laura made a critic um, on the idea of scarcity, but we are short of time here. Um, and I will have two more questions and then you decide on how you react. So the next one is a woman. Yes, please. I only have a film tip for you. Um, if, you want to, <laughs> if you want to um, no more read. Um but watch it. I have the documentary from Adam Curtis, Century of the Self. Uh, I really recommend it to you, to you and to everybody here. It's putting in pictures what you said, you both. Sorry, what's the, title? the Century of the Self by Adam Curtis. Okay, thank you. This was not a question, so another woman who has a question? <laughs> no, then you. Money and it's in a system where money reproduces itself. So the need of growth maybe comes from that, and we always have to pay it back. And if we want to end capitalism, maybe we have to end the need to uh, repay our debt, which we made up a couple, a couple of years ago. So is that maybe a point to discuss in which way finance and capitalism fit together? <laughs> Okay, and one last question for this round, please. Um, ich frage die Frage auf Deutsch. Das ist eher eine Verständnisfrage. Also, woran unterscheide ich denn gute Resonanz vielleicht von schlechter Resonanz? Weil ich meine, ich kann mir zwar vorstellen, dass es in kleineren Kreisen interessant ist, aber ich meine, in Deutschland hat man viel Erfahrung mit sehr schlechter Resonanz in der Politik gehabt. Und das äh, war auch eine schlechte Form der Resonanz. Okay, yeah, I think I start with this uh, last question. It's very, it's, this is really important, right? It's important to me because I don't want to create anything that might resemble these bad <coughs> forms of resonance which you uh, talk about. And I think it's, I think when you really think about it, it's very clear to see because uh, I, I would say in the first place, because I mean the case in the, the Nazis, right, the na National Socialism, and I think it's true uh, with the resonance theory, how I like to call it, you can really see why the Nazis were attractive to many people, at least you can explain some form of, of attractivity, because they really created spheres of resonance through music, through marches, through fires, through... Uh, um, flags and so on and but i think this is i mean i, I have to, i think there are two things where you can see this is wasn't resonance this is echo right yeah, because resonance is an, a relationship of answering it actually relates to the first question so i can uh, uh, t take up these two you're right i mean there's the experience there's the uh, there's the yearning for experiencing otherness but capitalism actually only sells you sameness, right? So people travel to Kenya, but then they live there. I mean, that's the classic example, right? Uh, but they, they, they eat and live within their own uh, surroundings and they have the iPhone with them and so on. So they are still have the same. And that's exactly the thing. I mean, it's bringing the other within your reach, right? It's a, a nostrification instead of having an, a relationship of answering. What I call resonance, right, means that there is something that speaks in a voice of, of his or her own and that, that in that sense contradicts you, right? It needs to be an, a, a something going back and forth and that's not what the Nazis created. They created something like an echo of identity, right? Sameness everywhere. And I think, but the, my, my main, my main uh, attempt to say, uh, to, to actually deal with the Nazi case or with these forms of, of cases is that their relation, what I call Weltbeziehung, their relationship to the world was in fact very repulsive, right? They created, I call it an echo chamb chamber, an, an echo kammer of resonance, right? Uh, in, as an, an empty oasis or island of resonance is in a repulsive world. They had the idea that we have to destroy everything that's not us, the Jews and the homosexuals and the Slavs and so on. And they, they felt that we are... Uh, that we are uh, in danger of being killed by all the others. It was a Darwinistic world. That was the idea of their world relationship. So it, this certainly wasn't a form of a resonating uh, uh, a world relationship, right? I th so I think the desire for resonance in an alienated world can create these dangerous forms you're talking about. 
I'm, yeah, I'm trying. Uh, so basically, there are at least two forms of governmentality, which are not uh, incompatible, of course. Like you know, the, the Amer in Foucault, of course. Uh, like the first one is the American one, more uh, subtle, if you want, more uh, soft governance, and the other one would be the German model, which is uh, more invasive. But in any case, the target is never the single individual or the single person or the single subject. It is the market. Yeah. And then what is externalized is the guilt. Post, uh, post ex post, but post factum. Like, you know, it's not <laughs> there, but <laughs> afterwards. A <laughs> precou. <laughs> it's very different from before. <laughs> it's not a for this way. Of governmentality, yeah, it's a post for this one. Okay. Biopolitical. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I don't. You can talk to each other. Uh, you're Italian as well. Spanish, Greek. Okay, also, oh, sorry. Um, who's next? Who's going next? The man with the glasses and the woman with the glasses. The depth question. Will you take this into the next round? Yeah? <laughs> you remember it, Hartmut? The depth question, yeah. the round with the glasses. You, you, you. Ja, ich, ich möchte mir 
Nein, ich fange mit der Schuldenfrage an, weil... Oh, I, I talk in English, yeah, sorry. Okay, I mean, this is a, I find it, this is a difficult question ideology involved right is it capital or is it money right and can we detach the two because capitalism at least in my understanding always has this materialist underpinning uh, while that and it has many other side uh, effects i mean i do agree that i do see this logic of how money gets into the world right every hundred dollars or euros which get into the world come at a certain interest rate right so it's so the need for increase actually is involved in the in the circulation of money, right? But uh, how this relates to the circulation of capital is very hard to distinguish. And I actually think that this money circulation thing wouldn't work without the capitalist underpinning, right? So it's not just the logic of money, it's still capitalism, but, it, but, but the logic of money and debt obviously is very closely involved. And I'm personally, I'm not an expert on this, but I think it, there might be a solution, right? In just uh, having a, a cut on debts as a starting point in order to move to the to the to the best to a better world but i'm not really an expert on this so i rather want to uh, be agnostic i, I want to get to the other points i mean your point what what is what is what is uh, what is the motivation right that is motivating you but but also probably me but you're right with the, with young with young people i think i think yeah i think i i think there is a moment it's this double movement right of of there are interesting things you can actually move to new horizons and you find it attractive to go to uh, go abroad and study in London or go some other places, right? This is attractive, right, that we're bringing the world in. But there's also a moment, a moment of panic in, in uh, what we do. I, I totally think it's true and I find it most interesting with, with a view to the new media, right? I don't say, as, I, as you saw, I have a smartphone myself, I don't say this is the devil or so. But what is true is that I think what we desire there is signs of resonance. I think it's Definitely true because if you look at the logic of Facebook or of Twitter or of these other things, you want the world to see you, to hear you, to answer you, right? Get likes, get comments, make new friends, and we get in panic if these things stay silent, right? On the one hand, the problem is someone, re re a young person, recently told me, "Well, my friends think I'm dead if I don't connect on on Facebook for three days or so, right?" So that's exactly the anxiety that the world forgets us, right? That we are not connected, and whenever the smartphone vibrates in your pocket because you get an SMS or something else, a WhatsApp uh, um, a message, then it's like the world is calling you. But the problem is that this is never, it's not a real resonance experience, right? We, we would have to debate why not, but I think it's not a real one because it doesn't last, right? It's only this very, it's a short shock which actually goes through your whole body. It's the world resonating with you. But, but, the, but, the, but it's not sustainable in a certain sense, right? So I think the desire for resonance and the fear of living in a silent world which forgets you, doesn't see you, doesn't touch and respond, that's, that's moving young people. But I found this other question, I, I have to say something about it yeah. uh, because it was very important and now I have to think of what it was. I mean, uh, one, yeah, I, I, yes, now the first part was, isn't resonance, so I think it's very good, it's both points are very relevant, right? The one, the, the first part was, then we just try to increase resonance, right? I, I said so far we try to increase education and, and health and money and, and friendships, and now we also have to increase our resonance capabilities and experiences. And, and th there I really think this is clearly false, right? Because you cannot accumulate resonance. You can really see it if you have some form of music which really touches you. My favorite Pink Floyd song, right? And then I say, good idea, I want to have it every day and I play it every day and nothing happens, right? This is the safest way to lose resonance, right? You can, and, and actually, if, if I try to instrumentally set the point, tomorrow at six, I will have an experience of resonance. This will never work, right? Resonance cannot, in this sense, be instrumentalized and accumulated. There's always this moment of uh, being um, uh, unverfügbarkeit. Uh, I forgot the English term for this, right? You cannot, uh, what? Unavailability. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, and, 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 the, the, and, the, and the second part of your question, yeah, I'm short. Uh, uh, the second part was the egoism. This is very important. Uh, resonance is not an egoistic thing. You cannot have resonance on your own because resonance is a mode of connecting. And the interesting thing is on the other side, what you're connecting to, right, is something what Charles Taylor, my, my, my guru when I was younger, right, calls a strong evaluation. That means you have to believe and to act like the thing you connect to 
speaks in a voice of his or her own and is important to you. This is why it doesn't work. I cannot have resonance with the microphone or so, right? I can have resonance with nature because I believe nature is important. It speaks to me. I can have resonance in art because I believe this is really, that's what how we talk about art. Art has its has a, has its own logic, right? We cannot manipulate it. Not totally re uh, translated into economy and so on. And of course, it's true with social relationships. But it's it, th therefore it's it's not egoistic, right? You have to connect to something that speaks of of his or her own and is important to you. Okay. Last chance, last round. Three more people, and then no, you're not. Um, okay, you in the door. Yeah, you. do carry resonance. So for example, if we go and have an experience with someone, then we may have a gift that they brought us, like a Valentine's Day present, or um, we do accumulate these things and they do have resonance for us. A piece of music that you hear when you're having a particular experience, you want to cover that piece of music. So there, there is an accumulation in that, in, in physical items. No? Okay, two more. Yes, please. What you say reminds me a little bit of the philosophy of dialogue, um, which I read some years ago, like Levinas or Buber, and um, maybe it's related to that. I don't know if it's. Um, but then it's about um, teaching and the educational system, which we talk about uh, on the afternoon, the sensibility um, and uh, get concepts out of it. How we how we get ourselves more sensible to resonance. Um, and to, to larger and wider rooms and alternative rooms for that ability to uh, feel something again out of music, world, art, and also get the, um, yeah, the ability to understand these concepts behind, because a piece of art um, sometimes needs a little bit, uh, bit more of knowledge behind it to get the resonance out of it. So um, it's both, it's like educational alternative uh, rooms and um, knowledge, how you get these concepts out of it. Okay, uh, yeah. please. Um, I'm not sure if I'm with you with the... Uh, uh, Louder. I think I have to read um, uh, Hartmut Rosa, uh, because I'm wondering if, for example, the process of defensization is not uh, trying to accumulate <coughs> Exactly what you're describing. Uh, what I'm a little bit missing is the differentiation between uh, individual, individual growth and uh, systemic growth. Uh, because, I mean, if, if I think uh, in my life, I'm 21, so uh, I have a long forward, but if, if I would still live in my 25 years, that uh, I think that there's somehow an anthropologic uh, constant that we want to grow. Also in the material uh, uh, level. So, so I think that the question should be uh, how are we enabling an individual growth without uh, systemic growth? Okay, time of confession, C31. Great. Um, one one wild, wild one wild card for the guy on the floor because otherwise he will hate me. So very short, please. Yes, two comments. The first one is there is a nice paper by two psychologists, Carter and Gilovich, and it's an empirical pa paper where they show that uh, experiential purchases are more relevant to uh, to happiness than uh, uh, material purchases. And the other question relates to what uh, one of the people before me said. It's uh, I completely agree with you with respect to to resonance. And the question becomes how we become less thrown of manipulation. So how we get this kind of, all those marketing activity, how can we can. And for me personally, it was kind of engaging into a breathwork and meditation. So maybe we should just start standing up and hugging each other and creating some space for resonance. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it might be yoga or other practices that, so I'm, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, I'd like to start with this. I mean, I think two things are obvious. I mean, one thing is that many, many people now turn to yoga in forms of meditation and so on, right, in order to reconnect 
to themselves and to their bodies and maybe to the world. I really think meditation and yoga are about having a different form of relating. Actually, I'm always, I, I'm, I'm puzzled for a long time that I thought, well, the interesting stuff about Zen Buddhism or so is that what they think is, a, is the best way of being, namely being void of anxiety and desire, right? Overcoming this is exactly what burnout is about. <laughs> When you're in a burnout, You neither desire something nor so I uh, but of course it's not the same right so I would say <laughs> the, the the aspiration is the difference is that in one case it's 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 being void of desire and anxiety in a state of resonance of of, of I would say that's the, what they aspire to in in Buddhism or so and and it's it's uh, being a void of being being unable to desire and and uh, and maybe even to feel anxiety in a state of complete alienation where nothing burnout is a state where nothing touches you or so and and clearly resonance has a physical side to it right so I think e even eye contact there is empirical proof from psychology true having eye contact to someone changes the way the outlook on the world in a certain sense so i'm not totally opposed to this but i'm opposed to turning my concept of resonance in any way into an esoteric concept so therefore i simply say no <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> now with the other questions no i i, do, I don't mean yeah. um okay growth I, i i agree i mean that's it's really difficult i, I think it relates to what someone said earlier isn't there always even in what i try to do too is a certain sense of of uh, personal growth right of, of 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 transformation of going somewhere i think probably we cannot do without it right it's very hard to not do it and, and then i think i mean on the one hand it, there is this difference we were talking about many times is it something i possess or am or is it a growth in a way of relationship of process i think that's a semin seminal difference and of course i think the worst part of individual growth lo logic is the quantification like this quantified self thing i mean people really do it they measure their steps they measure their sleep they measure their movements in order to optimize this and there i think you could clearly see what's wrong with the with the wrong form of optimization, right? Whether we need some sense of growth for this other concept, I'm not sure, but may maybe we do. Uh, a grow education, this is very important. I mean, Buber really, I think Buber and Levinas, I like very much, right? They are really, that, that's really about resonance, relationships, uh, um, um, uh, Begegnung, right? Uh, um, what is Begegnung in English? I forgot. Encounters, right? Yeah, encounter uh, forms of encounter uh, with the world, and I think education itself can be an experience of resonance, right? When is education interesting? It's true for for uh, discussions like this too. Very often we just sit there and we are totally unmoved and untouched, and you just and you every time we have to force ourselves for attention. But then sometimes, once in a year or so, it happens that this spontaneously happens right you feel that right now there's something important at stake and these experiences are totally important as classroom experiences i actually am in my book i'm writing i have one chapter on education where i try to 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 distinguish between forms of alienation in classrooms and forms of resonance and the first question was about items i think clearly there can be resonance with items that's obviously true right for many people cherished objects you even mentioned gifts right that's quite interesting because then With a gift, the resonance might not be with a thing, but with a person who gave it to you, right? So you just use it uh, but as, as a medium. But nevertheless, there is relationship to objects. I, I, I have a chapter on that too, right? Uh, <laughs> in a, now I find it important. It's true. The way we, there is reification in the way we deal with things. If you look at poetry or so, there's always also this idea, Rilke, die Dinge singen höre ich so gern, right? He, he, listening to the sound of objects, it's possible, but you cannot, you, ca you cannot, if you accum accumulate objects, you lose that sense right so even there is a different way of relating to things Adorno was talking about this also uh, with this idea that instrumental reason always nails down things so I agree there could be resonance with objects but I'm but, but I think that, that it, it only comes through this idea of strong evaluations only if you somehow can create really important strong meaning which you attach to the object right so meaning and object some there go together it's not the pure object of course Is there anything <laughs> you two want to add? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, so I'll avoid now eye contact with Hartmut. Um, so thank you very, very much to the three of you.
that suffices, I think. Um, so we had great resonance between Hartmut and the audience, as was to be expected. Uh, we had some resonance between Lele and Laura. <laughs> 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 but th thank you very much. Thank you. And so we four wish you a very nice rest of the conference. Um, have a nice evening. Hug each other. Hug yourselves and do what you want. <laughs>